so you probably won't believe my story, but here it goes. I was working in a ranger station at a small California state park, looking after the forest. It was late September, meaning the amount of hikers they were dwindling, and it wasn't like the summer where it's a great season for hiking. Yeah, the fall is great because the weather is very nice and mild, and we saw quite a few people through the summer months, but fall is when it definitely dwindles. As I said, I was doing what I needed to do, hiking around and patrolling the trails and doing regular ranger stuff, checking on things and making sure stuff was safe. I stopped to eat some lunch in an open field near one part of the park where there were no trees or big rocks, so a larger clearing. I sat down and was beginning to eat my favorite, a tuna sandwich, and I literally froze with a bite still in my mouth, stopping chewing, when I see these two dark pits, which were eyes, moving between tree to tree to my right. I just happened to look over in that direction and see something very large watching me. Then I hear branches and twigs snapping, confirming that what I was seeing was really there something very large and heavy moving and trying to evade any sort of sighting by me. Then I could hear deep breaths, almost like a panting or a heavy wheezing noise. After wanting no part to play in whatever this thing was, I got up, put my sandwich in its bag and my pail, and walked back off the trail. However, it had an interest in me. It was following me and was now moving briskly through the trees. I picked up my pace, and that's when everything around me fell quiet. Now it was beginning to feel very uncomfortable, like something could happen. I believe this thing followed me for a couple of miles before finally stopping, as the noises around me returned. To this day, I have no way to account for what it was that I saw, and I don't want to think about it. I've received many strange, bizarre calls as an officer. This is one of them. The call came in as a woman reporting to the police that she had heard and seen a large dog trying to break into her home. She sounded frantic. It told me she saw the creature trying to get in through her door several times before dialing 911. The dispatcher asked if the animal was actually inside her home. She told us no. The dispatcher asked if this thing was trying to get inside her house. She said yes and told the dispatcher that this was a large, vicious dog, larger than any dog she'd ever seen before. This continued on for several minutes until I finally arrived on the scene. I got out of my car and walked towards the house, flashlight in hand and ready for anything. Then I knocked on the front door. I waited several seconds and there was no response. I knocked again, still nothing. So I walked around the back of her home to see if she had gotten out another exit or entrance. I didn't want to break down her door. Maybe she wasn't in danger after all. About halfway up the driveway at the side of her house, I noticed a large missing section of fence that looked to be torn down, leading right off to the woods in the property next door. Then it occurred to me there were also large canine tracks that led over this fence right in the dirt, leading up to the house. As I crouched down, shined my flashlight, and began trying to investigate, I saw something that will haunt me forever. Growling at me from less than 20 feet away was a snarling wolf-like creature, standing on two legs right by the tree line leading off into the woods. This creature lowered its head and growled, and then jumped off quickly into the darkness of the forest. I had my gun drawn and ready, and as this thing disappeared, and I kept my gun focused, Two men appeared on the property whom I did not recognize. They were not fellow officers. They told me they were related to the woman inside. They both had firearms drawn but kept them by their side. I asked them if they knew what was going on. They both looked at me like I had two heads. The one guy said, you don't know. The second man just nodded toward the creature, whispering something. He began to tell me that this home is being attacked by a strange creature the same creature that also attacked his daughter while he was trying to get her home from school just weeks ago. They were kind of like an unofficial band of men who were trying to track down this creature. He also informed me they had been tracking this beast for weeks after it killed several livestock in another rural area. I began to inform him about animal control, but he said that they had already done so, and they did not believe us. 
and then he showed me photos of his wife's injuries after this beast tried to kill her in cold blood. That photo will stay with me. His photo was of his wife laying on an emergency room table, fresh stitches all across her right side, face and neck, and also needing her jaw wired shut due to nearly being bitten off by this thing. Immediately, both men's attention went right towards the woods where this creature disappeared, both drawing the firearm. The one man with the photo began shooting several times, and just then, we could hear the growling. And just there, faintly beyond the light of the house in the darkness, was this creature again. I've been trying to figure out what I was looking at. Werewolves aren't real. What else could this thing be if it's not a werewolf? Was this thing possibly some kind of mutation or maybe some sort of lab experiment? I don't know, but it kind of vanished again in the woods, and things seemed to calm down that night. I took the names and members of the two gentlemen who seemed to want to help, and let me know if there's anything I could share with them to help track down this strange creature. The woman inside the house refused to speak to me, or even come out and acknowledge my presence. I think she was so frightened by what had just happened. Personally, I have no explanations for any of this. I just know that it was a very, very strange call and a very strange night. I was hunting down in Stephenville, Texas during whitetail season. I was up in a tripod overlooking a pasture. Behind me about 50 yards away was a dry riverbed, but you couldn't see it because a dense screen of trees grew along both sides of the riverbed, but you could hike to it and there was another spot I would sometimes hunt on the other side. It was getting late, but there was still a decent amount of light. I had seen absolutely nothing that day, not even critters. So I'm sitting up in my tripod just watching when all of a sudden from behind me in or around the riverbed, I hear the most ungodly shriek howl roar that made my hair stand on end, and I damn well near peed my pants. It continued for about three minutes until it suddenly stopped, and that's about when I decided to call it a night. Ran the whole way back to my vehicle. I didn't see it, and I to this day I still wonder what it was. Didn't sound like a bobcat or coyote and Stephenville isn't exactly known for its big cats or any cryptids. Maybe some of you hunters out there have experienced something similar. I had horses out in the pasture. My two brothers, my sister, and I think one of the boy's friends went out to see the horses. We had 80 acres which butted up to logging property and wilderness. The river was across the dirt road from our property. We went out all the time in the dark, it didn't bother us at all. I rode my horse all over the hills and was never afraid. Well anyway, we went out to find the horses and I had a flashlight I was shining in the field looking for them. I had it at chest height sweeping the field. When I shone it back across the flat part of the field towards the river I saw two orange glowing eyes looking at me. I didn't hear anything at all. It didn't move. There are no trees in that part of the field and whatever it was, was taller than me. I have never been so afraid in my life. All the hair stood up on my body and I felt weak. Never have I felt that way and I have been in the woods all my life. I knew whatever it was, I was not supposed to be there. As I watched the strange thing was it closed its left eye and turned its head to the right. This was strange to me because I thought an animal would just turn its head out of the light, and that would mean it's right, I would leave you first. Anyway, I still did not hear anything as I turned around and started running for the house. I tried to get everyone in, but they would not come all the way into the house. I, on the other hand, did not go out at night again for a long time. Another time when we were hunting in, say, 2004 around Green Peter, I was walking behind my husband and in the mud I saw a track. I stopped and looked at it and looked again. I was kind of embarrassed to say anything, but I know in my heart it was a Bigfoot track. It had all the toes and the big toe was prominent. The back was kind of messed up because it was on a slope, but I know it was one. I wish I would have taken a picture of it. I wish I had not been embarrassed to say anything. My husband's family was camping in a houseboat on Lake Shasta when he was young. Him and his grandpa got up early to fish, and they looked up on a hill in a clear cut, 
and saw a black thing stand up and walk across the clear cut. Both my husband and his grandpa recall it. I don't know the year, but it must have been about 26 years ago. His grandpa told me the story and swears it was not a bear. Well, I hope I see another one. I hope it is not up close, but I want to prove to myself that it is real. I'm in the Navy and about 12 years ago, I was standing watch in a submarine engine room. We were underway, can't for the life of me remember where to, from, or just making circles. It was the mid-watch and I sat down to catch up on some logs. That's when I heard a woman's voice and felt the hairs on my neck stand straight up. No women on subs then I got up, looked around and found the other watches shooting the shit or doing their daily tasks. I thought maybe I had dozed off and dreamt it. I sat back down and heard it again, and it sounded like it was coming from outside the hatch I was sitting under. I said F this shit out loud and went to just be around the other guys on watch. I still get chills thinking about it, even now. I was a U.S. Army infantryman deployed to Afghanistan in 26, 2007 on the Pakistan border. I spent the majority of my nighttime deployment sitting outside of the FOB and mounted OPS because the CO thought if we did this then, the enemy wouldn't move at night. Which was ridiculous because nothing happens at night over there. Seriously, they don't have street lights or electricity, so unless it's a full moon you could trip into a wadi and break your neck. But anyway. So I spend 16 months over there taking turns sitting in the turret of the truck staring out into darkness. One eye seeing green from NODS, and the other seeing nothing from the pitch black. I got very accustomed to viewing the world this way, and if anything moved my eyes would pick it up instantly. Most of the time it was dogs or sheep or whatever so no big deal. So eight months in, I lose one of my best friends to a landmine. One of the shittiest days of my life. Us being infantry, we got about two hours back at the FOB to try to comprehend what just happened before the CO sends us back out on patrol, yay. So I'm sitting there in the turret staring out into the darkness, as usual thinking about the things that had just gone down. So obviously my mind isn't in the best place. Regardless, as I am staring out into the darkness my non-night vision, I catches some movement off to my right, and I distinctly see the silhouette of a person. This person is moving around the outside of our perimeter, and I figuratively shit my pants since this hasn't happened at all during my time there. So naturally I snap my head towards the movement to get a good picture of this person with my night vision to attempt to figure out what kind of crazy local villager is trying to get shot. Nothing is there. Creepy as F. So I figure I'm just stressed from losing my friend and calm myself down and settle back in for the rest of guard duty. So I go back to looking straight ahead and sure as shit as soon as my eyes get back to 12 o'clock, I see movement again out of my peripheral. Figurative pants shitting happens again. Again nothing is there through night vision. Still creepy as f. So at this point I've about had it with this crazy country and being shot at and all that stuff so I think to myself. Okay f it let's see what happens. So I turn my head back to 12 and watch out of my peripheral vision and I distinctly remember the shape of a person walking around the outside of our perimeter. I can only see this dark figure when I'm not looking directly at it, but like I said at this point I have no FS left to give, so I sit and watch. As I sit and watch I get the feeling that I know the figure who is patrolling our perimeter, and I am filled with the thought that is was my buddy who we had just lost earlier that day. Creepy instantly turned to comforting and I sat and watched the movement as long as I could. I still to the day believe it was him. So that's my story. I used to hike a park near my house, had been hanging out there for years. One time I was walking the main trail when I noticed an opening in the brush leading to an area I had never been before. I love exploring so I, of course, decided to check it out. I was walking around for a while when I noticed a fairly large bone in the leaves. I wasn't too concerned as we lived in a very ethnic neighborhood, and I just assumed it was a cow or pig bone that someone had left from butchering. 
but then I noticed the very human-looking pelvic bone laying close by. I stood there for a moment sort of comparing my pelvis to the one on the ground before getting my knife out and getting the F out of there. I called the police and led them to the bones and they agreed that the remains were human, although they theorized it was probably a homeless person. Grew up playing in the woods behind our house, cross-country skiing and snowmobiling in the winter, ice skating on the pond. There were no other houses up there, occasionally a snowmobile would pass through, but not often. One summer when I was a bit older, 15 maybe, went up there to ride my friend's dirt bike. There were some jumps up at the top of a cliff that we would take turns hitting. So I'm riding on the back up through the woods, and as we are passing the pond there is a tent. I say WTF and tell my friend to stop. I get off to investigate while he stays on the bike, but shuts it off. I was approaching the tent from the back and the window was open, and I see the tent is full of clothes, food, liquor, beer. Of course I'm rattling off all of this to my friend when I happen to look up and see that there is someone sitting in the doorway of the tent with their back to me. They haven't moved and are just facing forward with their back to me, which is odd because clearly they heard me. At this point I turn around and start waving to my friend and mouthing, let's get out of here, as if I can somehow sneak away now. Finally the guy says very calmly, come around. I stopped in my tracks and looked back, he's still not facing me and he says it again, come around. At this point my friend is starting the dirt bike and he yells, what did you say? The response again is just, come around. I jump on the back of the bike and we tear out of there up to the top of the cliff. There is a dirt access road up to the top as there is a water tower up there, but it's a pretty rough road so we assume this dude isn't going to drive up there. We stop the bike and head over to the edge of the cliff to see if this guy is following us. Sure enough he comes walking out of the woods from the same trail we came out on. He then proceeds to walk over towards some bushes and starts pulling branches down to reveal a gray truck that he had hidden. After uncovering the truck, he opens a box in the back and pulls out a rifle or a shotgun, then walks around and gets in the driver's side and starts hauling ass up the road. We take off running, I just run into the woods, my friend is screaming at me to get on the bike, but I tell him to just go and I keep running off into the woods. The truck comes to the top and stops by the water tower. I'm a good distance into the woods, but I can see the wheels of the truck and I hear the guy get out and start walking around. At this point I'm scared shitless, but just trying not to make any noise. It seems like forever, but he finally gets in his truck and drives off. So I start running through the woods again, away from the way we came. I eventually come out to a big field. There is a house at the other end of the field, and I know the people who live there. I really don't want to go back through the woods to get home, so I figure maybe they can give me a ride. So I'm walking through the field, and I see a gray truck driving up the road at the other side of the field. There are round hay bales scattered around the field, so I duck behind one of those and peer out to see the truck is stopped, just sitting there. Now what? So I make my way back towards the woods, keeping the hay bale between me and the truck. Eventually, he just drives off. I eventually make it to the house at the edge of the field, tell them what happened, of course they will give me a ride, and they are calling the police. Police go up and check it out. The tent is there, but no one is there. They tell my parents that they don't know who it was, but that someone had skipped out at the local halfway house, and they hadn't seen him in about a week, he drives a gray truck. A week or so later my friend comes by on his dirt bike and says there are a bunch of state cops up by the pond, so we ride over there to see what's up. The tent has been burned and a bunch of other stuff was still smoldering. Never found out if they ever found the guy or not. Back in August 26 I was 20 years old and working in a deli near my house. While I also attended a community college nearby, I remember it was a warm summer night and I was working till close, which was 7 p.m., and at the time it was around 6.30 p.m. The only two people left in the deli were my boss and I. 
I remember I was stocking drinks in the cooler towards the back of the store when I heard the front door open so naturally I looked, and it was a guy I had never seen before. And working at the same deli for eight plus years you tend to remember people, and so I figured he might have been from out of town. He had red hair and it almost looked like an afro which I thought was strange. He walks back towards me and he goes into the cooler and grabs a peach snapple, and soon as he walked past me the smell hit me. So I motioned to my boss and pinched my nose and he and I had a brief chuckle before I started walking to the front to ring the guy up. I get to the counter and soon as I looked up at this guy I felt my stomach drop. His eyes were black and he had pale skin and this blank stare. It's hard to explain but I felt as if he was looking through me and not at me. I asked him if he needed a bag and I got no response he paid for the Snapple and walked outside of the deli and then stood at the front of the store. So we closed up the store at 7 and we started cleaning up and 7.30 comes around and I look and this guy is still standing at the front of the store leaning up against the glass. He was so strange that my boss thought he was staking out the place waiting for us to leave. But technically he was a paying customer, so we couldn't tell him to leave just for being weird. So we shut the lights off and were walking out when my boss turns to the guy and says, Hey, I don't mind you hanging out here, but please don't lean on the glass. The guy turns to him and doesn't say a word, he just smashes the Snapple bottle on the ground at my boss's feet. And my boss at the time was a big guy. I'm talking about 6 foot, 380 pounds and covered in tattoos. So my boss gets in his face and says, What the F is wrong with you, dude? Now you're going to clean that shit up. The guy stares back at him again, not saying a word, and the whole time I'm thinking to myself, This guy is either insane or has the largest testicles on earth. Then after a few seconds he turns away and gets in his car and drives off. I go back inside and get a broom. And I swept it up and we called it a night. Wasn't the first time we had someone high come into the store. The next morning I woke up and put the news on and the first thing I see is that guy's face. Turns out the same night he stopped by our deli. He murdered and dismembered his neighbor right down the street from the deli. The cops caught him pulling up into his parents' driveway the next morning with the women's severed head in his trunk. To this day I wonder whether or not he committed the murder before or after he came to the deli. I don't remember seeing any blood on him, but then again I wasn't really looking for any. Well, I've spent many years on the ocean sailed from SF, Sia to Sydney, Australia on a 30 feet sailboat. I've seen plenty of amazing and intense things like storms, lightning hitting the water, super massive pods of dolphins, giant whales surfacing next to and following the boat in the middle of the night, etc. But by far the strangest, most perplexing thing I've seen is what I call the chessboard. Calm seas, middle of the night, I'm on watch looking out on the water, and I start to notice some flashing happening around the boat. Now the water was very bioluminescent, and he was used to a certain amount of organic type shapes, trails, etc., which can be spooky enough when a huge fish or mammal swims towards your tiny boat and swims under at the last second, then turns around and does it again, but this was totally different. Different color of light, much whiter and brighter, and the shapes were very square geometrical, seemed to be very near the surface. Anyhow, started off with three or four squares, each square was, I'd say, 12 by 12. Then more and more appeared, forming into a chessboard-type pattern. The chessboard stretched out as far as I could see in the night. They'd all come on for a while, then alternate lit squares. Change into random patterns like they were communicating. This went on for ten minutes, then everything went dark at the same time. I would so love to know what that was. Former submarine sonarman here. No windows, so it falls outside the creepy things I've seen requisite. More of a creepy thing we heard. I was stationed on the west coast. Whenever we would transit near a particular Californian city, within a specific area, we would hear over the headphones the something that started off sounding like a woman screaming and ended sounding like bullfrogs on a hot summer night. 
None of the sonar techs up through our chief knew what to make of it. We chalked it up to just being a merfrog and carried on. It was around 4 a.m. and I had finished a movie on the couch with my husband, but he fell asleep. Once it ended, I went to the door to have a cigarette before bed. We lived in a basement apartment and our door was ground level at the rear of the house facing south with a small backyard about 15-20 feet deep with three large trees lining the edge backing onto bush and swamp. When I opened our big door and looked out the screen door which had glass at the top and a screen at the bottom. I typically open the screen door a bit and set the bar to hold it and stick half of my body outside to have a cigarette. As soon as I set the bar and looked up, I immediately noticed three large glowing lights hovering at the very top of those three trees. Two white ones were in the two left trees and one red one in the tree on the right. I was taken off guard a bit and figured it was a reflection from the stove or microwave, so I concluded that if I moved or blocked the light, the light would go away. I ran into my bedroom, which had a huge picture window right next to the door I was poking out of. If it was truly a reflection, I'd see nothing in a dark room. So I peeked out of the blinds, and there they were. I was blown away, so I ran back out into the living room and looked again. For some reason, I cannot understand why I didn't wake my husband to show him. It was like I was in a state of shock, or like everything around me froze and I forgot about him. This time, when I looked out the door, it was still open a little bit. I stuck my head out, and all of a sudden, I had this overwhelming feeling of being exposed. And just as I jumped to shut the door in fear, I could make out multiple beings walking around in the backyard with two of them coming towards me at the door. But the way they moved was strange, like in one place one second, then another the next. I freaked and slammed both doors shut and ran to grab my video camera and ran into my bedroom to record. When I looked out, I could still see them. It scared me so much I couldn't handle the thought of opening the blinds, so I set my camera up and stuck it in the blinds. By this time, it was probably around 4.35 a.m., and I was wide awake in a state of panic in a half-seated position at the edge of the middle of my bed. The bed was against the wall with a large picture window spanning the entire bed holding the camera in the blinds recording and taking the odd terrifying peek when all of a sudden I'm waking up and it's sunny out. Only then I realized I was sitting or half falling off the end of my bed very awkwardly and the camera was on top of my dresser. I grabbed it immediately to review the footage. The first two playbacks were nothing and the third was only 30 seconds of blackness. I was devastated. Then it was like reality snapped back in and I looked up and it was 7.30 in the morning. For your information, I cannot just fall asleep sitting up or not in a bed laying down comfortably. So the odds that I just passed out are highly unfavorable because it has not happened since. I barreled out of the room to tell my husband and I couldn't speak fast enough. I was in a total moment of panic and anxiety. The first thing he asked is why I did not wake him, and to this day I'm so mad I didn't but I can't figure out why. I remember looking right at him laying there sleeping when I first saw the objects. Then it was like time around me was frozen. I was still in real time. Before that experience my husband and our, at the time, three years old daughter would see strange lights moving erratically, always flashing white and red in inconsistent patterns. We live under a flight path and are used to seeing planes and small water planes or helicopters pass over, but these flew much differently and very low also typically sighted and remained in the same area. After the experience, the sightings got more intense. Walking the dog, I would spot a large light or craft that would seem to stalk me. My husband would often notice lights following him while driving home from work. I'd go out into my driveway to see the stars with my daughter and end up always having a sighting. One night I put out the garbage and a red light about twice the size of a yoga ball hovering above the middle of the road very low. I looked directly at it and yelled, go away, quite a few times and returned inside. After that, we would rarely see them and were never stalked again. Though I do fear and I'm almost certain we are still visited, since over the past year, I've had a few very strange, vivid dreams that almost seem like memories of being on board a craft with my husband. 
Tons of other humans gathered in a large room with multiple entities, some larger ones in robes at the front watching, and others walking around. One female entity comes over and takes my husband by the hand and escorted him to a private room to briefly cover it. I am aware there are no answers to these strange events, but am more concerned about finding out if there were any related sightings or experiences in my area around that time and about my story being documented for research, etc. I almost forgot to mention the area of trees that the UFOs were hovering and seemed to be affected as the top of the trees died exactly within the top of it. This occurred in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada. I'm a dive master in the Gulf of Mexico. I was dragging our anchor out of, of the sand and away from the wreck when I noticed a small object out in the sand. I swim up to it, and it was a dive slate covered in barnacles. I'm thinking F yay, free dive gear, as I make my ascent. So I'm topside, customers are all settled and talking up their dives, so I decide to check out my new toy. This dive slate was a bit different from others I've seen. It had a wrist strap and has these flip-up slates, so it has three pages. It had a build-up of barnacles, so I took out my knife to shuck some of them off. After I was satisfied the front was clean, I opened it to the second page on it, in just a faint bit of graphite. It said, Help. This story is 100% true. That means there may be some typos, and it may not be as fantastic as some things you read. But it scared two armed guys who have experience in the woods. My friend and I used to hunt in Ocala National. I would drive us into the forest with all our stuff, and then we would hike for miles. We would look for signs of wildlife like deer rubs, scrapes, tracks, and poop. We often came across signs of coyotes and bears as well. Often, we would start our hike in the morning, get back in the car and go get lunch, then return around 1 p.m. and hike until dark. This time we went in late, like 2 or 3 p.m. I really wanted to check out an area where a controlled burn is just now regrowing its vegetation. Deer paths are a bit easier to follow through those hogs bed down in the muddy parts, and it's a perfect spot to set up a stand since it's a wide open area. This area was about two miles in and another half mile down an old logging trail. Took about two hours to get there. We don't walk loudly or quickly because as it's soft sand on the road and we look for tracks. Sometimes follow a trail. Now it's not incredibly desolate. There is a hard clay road we driving on. I drove my BMW 740IL and my Infiniti G37 XS in. Easy. The roads we usually follow on foot are only accessible by a lifted 4x4. But it's clear from the ruts that they are used at least a few times a week. Plus, no matter how far we go in, we find beer cans and bullet casings and signs of a fire. Usually when we arrive in the morning, there are a few trucks with dog cages parked on the side. The good old boys run dogs through the sectors, so we try to avoid those areas. The dogs aren't cute puppies, they're mean and drag wild hogs down by their ears, so best to avoid them. And their owners. They're usually good guys, but I'd rather not run into them when they're hunting. Anyway, we went in deeper than usual this time hoping to get away from all those dogs and noise and to check out that burned patch that was just starting to grow again. We saw much of the ordinary. Deer and coyote tracks. We also saw some bear tracks, big ones and little ones. Both cool and bad. The only black bear I don't want to see is a mama bear with her cubs. They get very aggressive. So we reach the burn field and see a whole lot of nothing. We sit for a while and have a snack to see if anything comes through. After about an hour, we decided to explore a small, seemingly fresh trail, then head out, like pushing brush out of the way kind of trail. We found the remains of a very old tree stand down the trail, and a beer can that was still shiny, and a pair of underwear that didn't look real old. We thought that was kind of funny. Some dude got drunk and shit himself for something hunting deer. Oh, I should mention we are armed to the teeth. 
Both of us have an AR-15 and a sidearm with extra magazines plus hunting knives. Am a decent shot. My friend is an NR instructor. Anyway, we totally mistimed our walk out, and it got dark while we were still deep in the forest. There was only a sliver of moon, so it was dark. Luckily, I brought my flashlight, and I had a light mounted on my gun. The trails are marked by ribbons on trees and can be hard to spot at night. I know that because we took a wrong turn. It's around 10-11 p.m. at this point, and we are still walking and came to a crossroad we didn't recognize, and we realized we had been walking for 30 minutes down the wrong trail. So instead of taking the trail heading west, we just decided to backtrack. You can't really know which direction the trail leads in the forest. On the way back, we started hearing sounds. We figured it was rabbits or squirrels. No problem. So we continue and the sounds clearly become the movement of one animal. So we turn out lights out thinking it's a deer or hog and stop walking. We wait for the sounds to get closer. I slowly realize that this doesn't sound like something moving on four legs. But sometimes deer can do that. They step with two legs at a time when they are trying to be quiet. The sounds suddenly stop. Deer must have smelled us. But it felt like it stopped close by so I turned my light on and panned around. Now remember, this trail is barely wide enough for us to stand next to each other. So it's just... Forest. On both sides and you can't see far in. I shine around and see nothing and hear nothing. We wait a minute, then give up and keep walking. Another 20-30 minutes go by and we start hearing rustling again. This time it's something really moving. Not tiptoeing around. We figure it's a group of hogs. Which made us a little nervous. Those things can suddenly surround you without you even realizing. But it clearly sounded like it was on our right. Also, small animals sound like bears when it's dark and quiet. Much louder than you would think. We stop on the trail to let whatever is coming pass over the trail in front of us. As soon as the rustling gets near the trail, I turn my rifle light and my friend shines the flashlight directly down the trail in front of us. About 30 yards in front of us, we just see a pair of white legs cross the trail and disappear into the woods. Okay, now we are freaked out. They looked human. And it's another 45 minutes of walking to get to the 4x4 four four only road. Then 10-15 minutes until we reach the car. And it all starts with walk straight ahead, where the thing crossed the trail. We definitely were weirded out. But both of us were armed and ready so we just kept going. Not much else to do. Not to mention it's midnight and we are tired. We hear the noises once more off in the distance, but it never came closer. We reach the car and usually we like to hang out for a while, check out the stars and talk. But we both had a gut feeling to just get in the car and go. We kept our guns loaded and hopped in the front seats. Remember, I am driving a normal sedan, not some off-road vehicle. So I have to take it easy turning around and leaving. I can't speed down this road. It's hard clay, but rain creates devotes, ruts, and mud. Well, I go not even a quarter mile down the road, and I have to swerve around a deep rut. My headlights fall onto a guy standing there about 10 feet from the woods. No trail or road going in. He is in a farmer's shirt and shorts. No backpack, gun, hat, flashlights or anything I could see. He didn't wave at us like he was lost. Just standing there. He didn't look at us while we passed him, but he started slowly walking down the road as we went by. This is not an area where anyone has cabins for many, many miles nor is there any civilization for a good 10 miles. This guy had no reason to be there. Is this guy what we saw cross our path? How would he trample through the woods for miles? This brush is not like the pinewood forests of the Northeast. It's thick scrub with nettles and palmetto bushes that cut you and snakes and ticks and all kinds of bullshit. I wouldn't walk through it in a long sleeve hoodie and jeans and boots, let alone a short sleeve t-shirt and shorts. And why the F was he following us? Did we stumble upon this guy's hangout spot when we found a fresh beer can and underwear? We did not call FWC or the police. I don't know why. I guess we just did not want to deal with them. Plus, they would be suspicious of us being out in the woods that late. 
We both were certain we saw human legs cross the trail. But it seemed so unlikely we decided we were seeing shit. Then we see this guy standing in the pitch dark with no moon and no flashlight. What? If it's true that this crazy F was stomping through thick brush, he had been close enough to us that if he charged he definitely could have tackled one of us before we could react. That is the weirdest thing that has happened to me in Ocala National Forest. I am not scared to go back. Typically, wherever the dogs run is a safe area. They scare off anything that would hurt you, including people. But I would rather not walk for hours in the pitch dark, just hoping our flashlights didn't run out of battery. We had our phones turned off to save battery in case we had to make an emergency call. If we even had service, at least we could use it as an emergency flashlight. Feel free to ask questions. I may have misremembered some parts. I wrote this at different times throughout my day, so there may be some parts that don't line up. It'll fill in those gaps tomorrow. It's 3.30 a.m. now, and I don't want to edit on mobile. Thanks for reading. I spent 28 years in the U.S. Navy, almost all on aircraft carriers. I've witnessed some awesome things at sea bioluminescence for one. But the creepiest was probably one of my deployments to the Persian Gulf, early 2000s. We sailed through acres and acres of dead sheep. Apparently, one of the big ships that hauls sheep up to the Emirates from Australia had a big die-off, and they simply dumped all the carcasses over the side. There had to be thousands of them. Aside from that, Another time in the Gulf, we frequently saw huge balls of sea snakes. It is creepy as F. I was fishing in a pond about 15 miles from town. It was late in the evening, and it was brewing up a rainstorm. I was with my cousin, who was a couple of years younger than I. I was under tree near the lake, and I kept seeing something shiny across the lake. If I tried very hard, I could cast across the pond. I was aware of the lightning and thunder. It was a rough storm with plenty of lightning. I noticed that the shiny spots were large and an equal distance apart. I could see the beings better when the lightning made everything bright. I kept looking for a while until I realized what they were. There were more than I saw, I am sure, because they were all walking a path across from me. It is rather bushy on that side, except for a trail that comes over the hill. We had parked about half mile from the lake because of a fence. It was easier to walk than go around. After I noticed they were real, I called out to my cousin who had walked off a little ways. They kept looking at me then at him, their eyes still shining. Their eyes were big and round and had slight oriental slant to them. They were short and skinny, long arms, big heads but not long heads, but large. I called to my cousin and told him what I was looking at. He came running and we picked up what we could and ran up to the truck. When we got to the truck, we looked back and could see more of them, but we were too scared to look for long. We rushed off and decided not to tell anyone. Now that I am older, I worry about my grandkids. This is a private lake and is used by few people. I have no pics. We did not carry cell phones at the time. Since they have been here for years, I don't think they are destructive to us, but they could be. I was recently working near a river in the British Columbia wilderness, when about 20 meters from me and my co-worker, we heard loud footsteps crashing through the trees. My co-worker yelled out, Nothing, the footsteps continued, but after he yelled out a second time, the footsteps stopped, and then things went completely silent. There was other people in the vicinity throughout the week, but to our knowledge, nobody there that day. I grew up hunting, and I am very familiar with the fauna of Western Canada. It sounded like a bull or cow moose or elk, perhaps a sizable buck. But to my knowledge, they don't have the smarts to actively hide from humans when they are yelled at. Same with bears. Mountain lions, however, do. But I don't believe one would ever be so loud and clumsy sounding. WTF was in the woods. I'm not above thinking it was perhaps a Bigfoot. Or was it a sinister person?
I worked at a dog sledding company in northern Ontario this past winter. Our building was about a kilometer from the dog kennels. I know very well the routine barking and howling you mentioned. Our dogs about 35 would do it usually twice a night. To other people it sounds aggressive, but when you know the dogs and their barking it sounds fine. I have never liked being outside at night, and my housemates like to have a fire most nights about 50 feet from the building. One night I was sitting in the common area reading, about 11 p.m. Suddenly they came bursting into the house yelling. I could hear the dogs barking, and over my friends yelling in panic, I could hear something wasn't right with the dogs. The barks were shrieking and short, something was happening. Occasionally a dog would get out and pick a fight with another dog, that's what it sounded like. The aggressive growl barking. I stayed at the building while the others piled into the cub cadet to go break up the fight. They came back ten minutes later, white as ghosts. A wolf had gotten in and a few of the dogs in one kennel had torn the fencing down and attacked it. Wolf was on the ground dying. Four of our dogs were laying around the kennel in pieces, two more dying. They shot the two dogs and wolf and were coming back to take a few minutes before picking up the pieces. The rest of the pack may still have been around because it's unlikely one wolf killed six dogs by itself. I don't work there anymore. Way too intense for me. Last night I left to go home from a camping trip in Arizona. And let me tell y'all, something scared the shit out of me. I was driving back home to Cali from the forest in Forest Lakes, Arizona with my boyfriend in the car. Suddenly we see a huge dog-looking creature with white and brown on it. It was running in and out of the trees on our left side. My boyfriend and I try to slow down to see what the heck it was. But all of a sudden when I barely can get a glimpse, it started sprinting at my car on my side, mind you. I had the windows down, it was a cool night. But I shit you not, I freaking didn't hesitate to hit that gas pedal and GTFO there. I didn't care to look back or anything. I had that gut feeling and wanted out. But yeah, weird situation. Does anyone know what I might have seen? I know what a dog looks like in animals, but this thing gave me a whole different vibe. Just today I found a trail cam facing a daycare on one of the properties I manage. I cut it out of the tree. It's pretty creepy because the SD card is full of pictures from December 30, 2017 to Jan 1, 2018. So in three days the entire thing got full and no one came back for it for over a year now. There's no pictures of anyone setting it up. There's several pictures of cars driving by and an occasional picture of someone entering or exiting the building. But you can't make out any faces or license plates and again, no images of anyone setting it up or walking near it at all. Me and my co-workers came up with a few theories. First and easiest is a pervert. He got locked up for something else, and that's why the SD card hasn't been cleared of data in over a year. Second is a police investigator or fraud investigator, because the camera is facing the front door and the handicapped parking spots. Was someone claiming disability and handicap when they really weren't, and the camera was put there to catch them walking with ease? Still doesn't explain why the trail cam would still be there, though. Last is a jealous or suspicious lover spying on someone. Did they see what they needed and kill themselves? Did they kill the other person and get locked up? Maybe they had multiple trail cams and got the info they needed off a different one. Very creepy to me, though. This happened about 15 years ago back in Mexico. Me and my dad along with some friends were out in the woods gathering firewood. Old dirt road used mainly by cattle and ranchers. No other traffic that far out. Ten minutes later, this nice new truck with tinted windows coming from the opposite direction stops maybe 25 feet in front of my dad's truck. We could hear somebody crying in the truck, most likely a woman, but I'm not sure but me being like 10 didn't think much of it and continued to grab fallen branches. The truck just stopped, but no one got out of the vehicle. My dad told us that it was enough for the day and it was getting dark. 
All the older guys in the group seemed to know something was up and jumped in the truck in a hurry. I even got my finger smashed on the door because of it. But again, I didn't think much of it aside from my finger getting bloodied. I remember my dad driving fast. They talked and murmured, but it was grown-ups talk to me and all I could think of was my finger and the pain. When we got back to the town, my dad pounded a few beers and they talked. Several years later, when I was in my early 20s, that memory came back and I connected the dots to what we witnessed. I never felt so much fear in my life before. To this date is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I don't have the guts to bring it up to my dad, but I'm pretty sure that it was some sort of cartel-related deal. But for some reason, they decided that we didn't see anything. Also, this is because back in the day and in my area, you never really heard of crime like that. The only crime was cartel on cartel super secretive crime. So I'm sure that whoever was inside probably had something to do with them, if it was cartel related. But I can only imagine what my dad felt having me and his friends with him there and seeing something that we were not supposed to see. It could have gone terribly wrong for all of us. I used to work at a weather station in northern Canada. It was a 24-hour place, so it was manned round the clock, and often by someone who was awake. I worked nights many, many times, and I didn't see much creepy stuff, but heard a lot. Fairly nearby was a place where a couple of local guys housed their sled dog teams. You'd hear them yipping and barking now and then, and it was quite routine. Other times it was apparent that a bear or wolf was over there and bugging them in their cages because it was a lot more than normal barking. It was the sound of shit scared dogs freaking out. I only heard this next thing happen one time, but pretty clearly something had gotten in there and killed at least one dog. I heard the sound of a living critter screaming while it was being killed and it totally knew it. There is no other way to describe it. If you heard it, you'd know. I walked with cautious excitement through the old Comanche Reservation. My name is Hosa, a young Comanche Native American archaeologist deeply connected to the rich history and spiritual traditions of my people. Today, I had stumbled upon a burial ground that had been concealed from us for centuries. As I brushed away the dirt and leaves, I uncovered ancient texts etched onto weathered stones. The symbols spoke of a forgotten era revealing a harrowing tale of an unknown predator that had ravaged our ancestors 200 years earlier. The text spoke of its monstrous features of beast with antlers, a snout, and six terrifying legs. The predator's insatiable appetite for blood left our people in fear and despair. Intrigued, I delved deeper into the mysterious history of our tribe. However, with every step, I couldn't shake the feeling that unseen eyes watched my every move. Strange occurrences surrounded me, the whispers of the wind carrying warnings that echoed through the trees. It wasn't long before I realized that the unknown predator described in the texts was not just a relic of the past. It was real, and it was pursuing me relentlessly. Fear coursed through my veins as I witnessed its monstrous presence in deep woods while I was hunting. Its antlers piercing the night sky, and its six legs propelling it with unimaginable speed. Determined to protect my people and unveil the truth, I embarked on a perilous journey. Armed with knowledge and guided by the spirits of my ancestors, I sought to confront the predator head-on. It was a battle of survival, a clash between human will and primordial terror. After many heart-stopping encounters, the ultimate twist revealed itself a betrayal that cut me to my core. Our tribe leader, the one whom I trusted and respected, had concealed dark secrets that were meant to stay buried. The predator, it turned out, was somehow linked to our own people's history, a curse that had been hidden for generations. With clarity, I understood that the responsibility to end this cycle of fear and betrayal fell upon my shoulders. Armed with my ancestral bow and arrows, I faced the predator in a final showdown. Adrenaline surged through my veins as I unleashed a barrage of arrows, each one finding its mark until the beast finally fell. As the life drained from its monstrous form, it vanished before my eyes, 
leaving behind only a lingering sense of victory mingled with sorrow. I had fulfilled my duty, but the wounds of betrayal ran deep within my soul. In the end, I emerged from this terrifying ordeal with a newfound strength and resilience. The burial ground, once shrouded in darkness, had now been exposed to the light. I vowed to protect my people and ensure that the sins of the past would never haunt us again. For it is through the wounds of betrayal that we learn the power of our own spirit and the strength to build a brighter future. I am a biologist, and one of the perks of the job is being able to see some remote and spectacular places that people don't see very often. Part of my work involves collecting insects from remote water holes out in the middle of Australia, a few hundred kilometers north of Uluru. One of the ladies I work with, Alice, lives out there full time, spends a lot of time out bush, and has spent a lot of time with the local Aboriginal people, so she has a trove of stories and weird experiences. But I'll just tell you about the one I had. So as I said, I visit a lot of water holes out there. Being a very arid region, these water holes hold great spiritual and cultural significance to the indigenous people. Most, if not all of them are sacred in some way, and they all have traditional stories attached to them. So one day four of us headed out to this particular site, a full day of heavy four-wheel driving through the Fink Gorge. We get there not long before sundown, and as we pull up, there is a black dingo standing in the spot we are going to camp. He stares at us for a bit, then disappears off into the bush as they do. This in itself isn't weird. Plenty of dingoes out there, and they come in a range of colors. Not that common to see a black one, but they are around, so that's fine. We set up camp, have a nice night of looking for pythons and drinking wine, yep, biologists. We slept in swags kind of like a tent that just fits a sleeping bag, and sometimes has a little fold-up netting bit so you can sit up in there. It was really windy that night, so no problems with spooky noises, and I went to sleep pretty quickly. That night I had a really vivid dream about the black dingo coming into camp, sniffing around my swag and scratching at the netting trying to get in. It bothered me and I woke up, but went back to sleep pretty soon after. Still, not so weird. We woke up in the morning, did our sampling, packed up camp and started off on the long drive back to town. After we had been driving for a bit, Alice starts talking about how seeing the black dingo at the campsite when we got there really freaked her out. She didn't say anything earlier because she didn't want us to be spooked. Turns out that in the traditional folklore, that waterhole is protected by a black dingo spirit. The last time Alice camped there with other people, one of them had a dream that a black dingo came up to their swag and started attacking her. This lady woke up with long, deep scratches all over her face and no reasonable explanation for them. I had no idea of this story before I had the dream and didn't mention it to anyone that morning. There is definitely a special feeling to a lot of these places. Very hard to describe. When you are out in this country, these kinds of weird semi-spiritual coincidences are commonplace. I have some more stories, but I'm typing on my phone and my thumbs are sore. A few years ago, my wife and I were living near Laneville, Texas, which is located in Russ County on farm to market route 225. My wife loves gardens and we always had a chicken pen. Our adult children enjoy the garden produce and the fresh eggs from our hens. We lived this way for many years after we moved there in 1981. We had no intention of ever going back to the big city. The incident that I'm writing about happened in 2015 and it signaled the end of our chicken business. Each morning I have to walk down to the chicken pen that was 150 feet behind our house. After I fed the chickens and checked their water, I headed back to the house to eat breakfast. I had guns, but I never carried one around our own property. At that time, we had a terrier who went everywhere we did. She had never shown any inclination to be afraid of anything, but on this day, I was in the middle of my chores when the terrier stopped dead still. She was fixed on something beyond the tree line behind the chicken pen, and the hair on her neck and back stood straight up. 
She was frozen in place and didn't move a single muscle. I shifted my gaze to the tree line and what I saw caught my breath. I knew I was looking at something I had never seen before. This thing apparently had been walking just outside the tree line and it stopped when we did. It seemed to be the size of a wolf. Its head was light gray and there wasn't a single hair on its body. Its rear legs made it appear as though it could easily walk on all fours or stand upright like a man. The tail was the same length as its body, and from where I stood it looked like a dog until it turned revealing a head that looked more like a feline than a canine with similar short pointed ears. The eyes were something unworldly. They were bright blue and bored into us for about 15 seconds showing no sign of fear. It then turned and walked to the woods and out of sight. I tried to make sense of what I had just witnessed as I hurried and tossed the chicken feed into the pen. I realized that the terrier had already hightailed it back to the house ahead of me. Over breakfast I told my wife about the encounter, and from that day onward the terrier would not go near the chicken pen unless she was with me. Even then she stayed behind me always watching the woods. I did too. It's strange how random things can suddenly make sense once you see a connection. A few weeks later, a feral dog got into the pen and was trying to kill a chicken. I was going to gather eggs and ever since the strange encounter that day I had begun carrying a rifle with me. I shot the dog, got a shovel, and dug a hole behind the pen. The feral dog was the size of a large collie and must have weighed 80 or so pounds. I had to drag the carcass to the hole and roll it in. After burying the dog and securing the pen I went back to the house and that was the end of it, or so we thought. Two days later, while feeding the chickens, I noticed something odd behind the pen. I walked around to take a look. What I found was a hole two feet across right where I had buried the dead dog and the carcass was gone. There were no drag marks, so whatever it was, it was big enough to pull the body up out of the dirt and carry it off without leaving a trail. I searched all over the back of our property and never found anything that would suggest some sort of scavenger was at work. My wife and I were the only ones who knew what I had buried back there. The next morning when I went to feed the chickens, it looked like a crime scene. They were all dead and their headless remains were scattered about the pen. The rooster had been tossed 20 feet from the ground into the top of a persimmon tree. Oddly enough, given the scale of the carnage, there was not a single drop of blood anywhere. The gate was latched and there was no hole in the fence or signs of something that gained entry by digging under the fence. But the killer had left some evidence behind. There were footprints and deep gouges made by three long claws that were estimated to be two and a half inches long. I drove over to my neighbor's house and asked him to have a look at the tracks. He was a hunter who was born and raised in the area, but even he was stumped. He suggested we call a friend of his who was a constable and another longtime resident. He looked at the tracks and examined the dead chickens. After he noticed the dead rooster dangling in the tree, he warned us not to go out at night without a gun. We decided not to replace the chickens. Not long after that incident, we moved to another location. We just didn't want to cross paths with whatever was lurking around the property. I live in Michigan and regularly go out trapping or coyote hunting. One day I'm taking a long time friend hunting for the first time. He lived out of state so he wasn't familiar with the area and its types of people and habits, so to speak. Anyways, we were walking along and unfortunately the coyote spot I usually used had now been useless after so many uses of traps and shots taken. So we went a bit deeper to look for a better spot. The coyotes had a den in some lowlands and thick brush. I don't usually go out there, but I didn't want my friend's first hunt to be a boring one, so we pressed on. After a bit of walking, my friend noticed a blood trail, and I assumed another hunter hit and wounded one. I figured we would track to make sure it didn't suffer, so we followed the blood trail. The strange part was we didn't notice any tracks, and it was winter, so tracks would be easy as day to spot. However, when we reached the source, we ended up finding something a lot more gruesome. We came across the dead bodies of a man and woman. The man had a crossbow bolt in his stomach and looked like he had been stabbed. 
The woman was stabbed much worse and looked like she had been, quote, sexually used. Needless to say, we called the police. I've never been back to those woods since, and now when I got out I wear body armor underneath my vest and always go with a partner. I'm always going to go back to the forest, and this isn't a hunting story, but here's one unknown thing that really freaked me out. I was hiking the highest peak in Utah with a small group over one fourth of July weekend, and we had to backpack in about 12 miles to where we would set up camp. One of the guys in our group owned two pack llamas and brought them along to carry some stuff. The owner said that llamas are very territorial and will make a high pitched gobbling sound if they feel threatened. I thought that was weird and didn't really believe him. On the second night after summiting the peak, I had a crazy headache and wasn't getting any sleep in my tiny single person tent. I had been laying there for hours after everyone else had gone to bed and it was late into the night when I started hearing gobbling from the llamas in our camp. Sitting alone in a tent with no protection and not knowing what is looming around my campsite did not make for a fun night and that was the last time I slept in a tent. In the morning everyone said they were asleep and did not hear anything. In the shadowy woods, there stood a remote cabin that had long been forgotten by the world. The cabin was nestled far from civilization, its weathered walls and creaking timbers bearing witness to the passage of time. It had seen countless hunters seeking refuge within its walls over the years, but none had ever truly understood the chilling secret that dwelled within. One crisp autumn weekend, my friends and I decided to escape the bustle of city life and embark on a hunting trip. We were a group of seasoned hunters, drawn together by our shared love for the outdoors and the thrill of the chase. The cabin, hidden amidst the wilderness, seemed like the perfect place to call home for a few days. As we approached the cabin, the beauty of the surrounding forest took our breath away. The trees were adorned with the fiery hues of fall, and the air was filled with the crisp scent of pine. We couldn't have asked for a more picturesque setting for our hunting weekend. The cabin itself, though showing signs of wear and tear, had an undeniable charm. Its quaint appearance, with a front porch and a chimney that released plumes of smoke into the brisk air, was straight out of a postcard. We eagerly unpacked our gear and settled in, ready for a few days of camaraderie and adventure. The first night was filled with laughter and stories, accompanied by the comforting warmth of a crackling fire. We shared our hunting plans and strategies, all the while unaware of the dark history that clung to the cabin's walls. It wasn't until the second night that we began to feel a shift in the cabin's atmosphere. It started with subtle noises, soft footsteps echoing in the hallway, doors creaking open and closing on their own, and a persistent tapping against the window pane. We dismissed them as the quirks of an old cabin, but the unease settled in the pit of our stomachs. As the hours passed, the atmosphere grew increasingly oppressive. A cold breeze swept through the cabin, extinguishing the fire, despite the fact that all windows and doors were securely shut. The cabin seemed to come alive with eerie shadows that danced along the walls, their movements unsettlingly deliberate. A sense of dread descended upon us, and we exchanged worried glances. That's when we heard it a faint, mournful wail that seemed to emanate from the very walls themselves. The hairs on the back of our necks stood on end as the sound grew louder, echoing through the cabin with an otherworldly, anguished quality. We knew then that we were not alone. The cabin was haunted, and the restless spirit of a previous owner had been awakened by our presence. It was a truth we couldn't deny, no matter how much we wanted to rationalize the inexplicable. The spirit, it seemed, was trying to communicate with us. We could feel its presence, a malevolent force that bore the weight of unresolved pain and anger. It yearned for something, something that had been denied to it in life, and it was determined to make us understand. We tried to leave to escape the cabin's oppressive grasp, but each attempt was thwarted by an invisible force that seemed determined to keep us trapped. Panic and fear took hold as we realized the truth our hunting weekend had become a nightmarish ordeal. As the night wore on, we huddled together, desperate for answers. 
we began to piece together the story of the cabin's previous owner, a man who had met a grisly end within these very walls. His restless spirit sought retribution, and it seemed that we were the unwitting targets of his torment. We spent the night in terror, our sleepless hours filled with chilling encounters and ghostly apparitions. The cabin had become a prison, its walls closing in around us as the vengeful spirit grew more insistent in its demands. By the time the first rays of dawn broke through the trees, we were physically and emotionally drained. The spirit's presence had left an indelible mark on us, and we knew that we could no longer stay in the cabin. With trembling hands, we gathered our belongings and made a final attempt to leave. As we crossed the threshold, a bone-chilling scream pierced the air, echoing through the forest. It was a sound that would haunt our nightmares for years to come. We fled the cursed cabin, never looking back, and made our way back to the safety of civilization. The hunting weekend we had so eagerly anticipated had become a harrowing ordeal, a brush with the supernatural that left us forever changed. We learned a powerful lesson that weekend, one that transcended our love for the hunt and the allure of the wilderness. Some secrets are best left undisturbed, and some cabins, no matter how picturesque, are forever haunted by the restless spirits of their past. About 30 years ago, my five-year-old daughter and myself had been invited out to be a part of a friend's wedding party. The event took place at their family's rural summer camp in Halkirk, Alberta. We were there as a group preparing for the wedding a week ahead of time, and the women of the wedding party were being housed in a mobile home on the camp property. One night, just days before the wedding, I was awoken by a strange sound and upon opening my eyes, I noticed a very bright beam of light shining in the curtainless window beside our bed. I sat up to investigate, and my first thought was that a helicopter was hovering in the sky above the home. But looking up I realized that what I was seeing was nothing like a helicopter or anything I had ever witnessed before. I saw what looked to be an almost silent, huge dark form hovering in the sky humming slightly and shining a very narrow beam of light from quite a ways up directly into myself and my daughter. I froze. Scared out of my mind, I realized that what I was seeing was not anything my rational brain could figure out. I sat there stunned as minutes went by, and this object continued to hover without moving at all. I finally reached over and woke up my daughter, who instantly became frantic. I grabbed her from the bed, raced to another bedroom occupied by another bridesmaid, and woke her up to tell her what had happened. The next day I was sheepish to talk about what we had seen as the bride and groom were extremely Christian and conservative, and I thought that they wouldn't appreciate or approve of hearing my story. To this day I have never been able to forget that night, and I have never been able to sleep without closed windows and curtains pulled tight. I'm back home in the UK in my little cottage with my baby boy. I just put him down for a nap and I was pottering around when I developed severe pain in the tummy. I went down like a bag of potatoes. I couldn't stand, the pain was so intense that I thought I was dying. All I kept thinking of was my son and who would love him and care for him if I'm not here. After a few minutes, the pain went away as quickly as it came on. However, I contacted my doctors to book an appointment to check what was going on. My doctor examined me and my tummy was tender, so he sent me for an endoscopy, which is where they send a camera down your throat to have a look at what is going on. A week before my endoscopy, I had an amazing experience that I'll never forget. I woke up in the middle of the night and felt a presence in my room. I slowly shrugged it off and started to fall back to sleep. However, I became aware of three childlike alien beings on my bed. I didn't feel scared and I stood up and I held hands with two of them, one on one side of me and the other two aliens on the other side of me. My bedroom wall then started to spin and turned into a porthole and all four of us walked through. We came to a massive room with lines of computers and a large computer screen on the main wall, very much set up like a NASA mission control center but instead of humans at each computer, there were aliens. The room was white, everything was white, and on the large screen on the main wall, 
there was a famous male celebrity, and I knew they were studying this male celebrity. I then looked down at the aliens that I was with and instantly knew that these three little guys were also studying me and that they knew far more about me than I did about myself. They had been studying me right from the beginning of my life on Earth. In the next scene, I remember I was lying on a medical bed and there was another alien, which looked exactly like the childlike alien, but she was tall and adult-like. I knew she was female and she spoke to me using telepathy. She started the operation and I started to scream and I mean scream, and she stopped what she was doing and told me off in a very stern way. She said the pain wasn't real and that I actually can't feel anything and to be quiet. I did what she asked. She pulled two worm-like creatures out of my tummy. They wiggled and looked very much alive. I was shocked at what came out of me and disgusted. She said there was one left in my tummy, but for some reason she left it in there. The last scene I remember was being outside, sitting at a table with the three childlike aliens having a cup of coffee. Aliens were walking to what seemed like work and I was drinking coffee. I found it hilarious that they also had coffee and drank it like us humans. What I also found strange was that even though I was the only human there that I could see, no one gave me a second glance. It must have been common for them to see humans, I suppose. I went for my endoscopy a week later at my local hospital, and they just found inflammation of the stomach. However, I feel that these beings helped me in some way and maybe even healed my stomach. I'm not 100% sure, but that is my conclusion at the moment. Even though this was my first conscious memory of being invited to an alien world, I feel I must have been there many times before. I'm not sure why I was allowed to remember that experience, maybe to help with the healing process. I would love to know what those worm-like creatures were and how they got into my stomach. The worm-like creatures they extracted from me remind me of the scene in the first Matrix movie, which I find interesting. I've driven the highways of this country for longer than I can remember and I've seen my share of strange things on the road. So it was a lonely road, the kind where the only company you have is the hum of the engine and the soft glow of your dashboard lights. The radio had been nothing but static for hours, and my eyelids were growing heavy with exhaustion. That's when I saw him a hitchhiker standing by the side of the road, thumb outstretched, a silhouette in the darkness. At first he seemed like any other weary traveler looking for a lift. He was dressed in worn-out jeans and a faded flannel shirt, a backpack slung over one shoulder. I pulled my rig to a stop and rolled down the window. Need a ride? I asked, my voice echoing in the silence. He nodded, a grateful smile on his face, and climbed into the cab. I could see his face now, a young man with tousled hair and tired eyes. He didn't say much, and I didn't press. I knew how it could be on the road, sometimes you just needed someone to share the journey. As the miles passed, I couldn't help but feel something was off. He was too quiet, too still. It was as if he was a shadow, a ghost of a person, just there but not really. I tried to shake off the unease that settled in my chest, blaming it on the fatigue that had been gnawing at me. Then as we rounded a bend in the road, a pack of creatures emerged from the darkness. They looked like nothing I'd ever seen before half man, half dog, with matted fur, snarling muzzles and glowing malevolent eyes. They blocked the road ahead, their growls and barks echoing in the night. I slammed on the brakes, my heart racing as I fumbled for my phone, thinking I had to call for help. But before I could even dial, the creatures lunged at the truck, clawing at the metal and snarling with ferocious hunger. Panic surged through me, desperate, I turned to the hitchhiker, my voice trembling. What are these things? What do we do? But when I looked at him, I froze in terror. His face had changed, morphing into something twisted and ghastly. His eyes were hollow voids, and his skin was translucent like a ghost's. He reached out a hand, and it passed right through mine. With a cold, eerie smile, he whispered, I'm sorry. Before I could react, he vanished leaving me alone in the cab with those nightmarish creatures clawing at the windows. I knew I had no choice but to put the pedal to the metal and drive. 
With a roar of the engine, I tore through the night, leaving the pack of dogmen-like creatures behind in the rearview mirror. As I sped away, my heart pounding, I couldn't help but wonder if I had just encountered a ghostly hitchhiker or a malevolent spirit. One thing was certain I'd never pick up another hitchhiker on a desolate highway again, not after the night I met the hitchhiker who vanished from an accident seen years ago, and the night the dogman-like creatures tried to tear me apart. On the day it happened, I was hiking on a small trail alongside a stream off of a forest road in Lassen National Forest in northeastern California. There were a couple of cars along the road, so I thought it would be a safe place for me to hop onto a small trail. I like to hike in some odd places, practicing my navigation skills with a map and a compass and my phone GPS app tracking my path. I like to pinpoint some unique land features on a topo map and go find them. I usually go with a group of orienteering friends, but that day I was hiking solo. When I'm alone, I don't go too far into the forest. However, the events of that day drove me deep into the forest. The stream was rather small compared to the actual stream bed, which was odd considering there had been a decent snowfall over the winter. I also noticed that there was a lot of algae in this stream and a quarter mile and I could smell a rotting trout long before I came upon it. There were pieces of trash littered along the stream. I also came across a few small dead animals near the stream as I walked along the trail. It was disgusting, but I assume this is a popular area with teens or target shooters, and they probably left some trash behind. I didn't know that these were the warning signs of what I was walking into. About a mile in the trail diverged from the stream and cut through the shrubs and trees. I was close to my destination, a spot along the stream that looked like it could possibly have a small waterfall. The trail turned left, and it opened up to a large flat clearing. I stopped immediately, looking across the clearing. There was trash everywhere, and there were rows of cultivated dirt, but the plants were all uprooted. There was a holding pond lined with plastic sheeting along the stream, and there was a pile of sports drink bottles filled with a milky pink fluid next to it. Along the edges of the garden were what looked like homemade spike strips, boards with nails driven through them. I could smell the distinct odor of marijuana in the air. This was an illegal growth site. There had been enough news reports about what happens to people who come across these illegal growth sites for me to know that I needed to get away fast. I turned and I ran into the shrubs on the opposite side of the trail. Hiding behind a crumbling tree stump, I checked my map to make sure I was heading into uneven terrain where I would be unlikely to find another garden. The cars at the trailhead likely belonged to whoever was maintaining this garden but since they weren't at this location, they were probably at another. I started to stand up, but dropped back down holding my position when I heard a pair of male voices talking in Spanish. I recognized a few words like mountain and up when they were talking, and they kept repeating grand, grand. When their voices faded away, I quietly started to go in the opposite direction, putting distance between me and them. The map indicated that if I kept going east, there were no streams and there would be some decent elevation changes. But afterward, there was a forest road I could follow. I walked straight through maintaining an eastbound path for half an hour until I heard a soft wailing sound coming from the left of me. I stopped dead in my tracks. It sounded like nothing I'd heard in the forest before. It didn't sound like an animal, it sounded human. I could smell a strange odor in the air, and I noticed some long tracks on the ground that looked like a bare double step but one side had splotchy blood in it. I grabbed my bear spray and knife out of my bag and stood still, looking around for the source of the noise. I took a couple of steps forward and everything went silent. Suddenly, I felt something crash into my left side from the rear knocking me to the ground. I looked up terrified that it was a bear, but it looked like a massive man covered in dirty blonde hair and very tanned skin. He grunted at me and then collapsed on the ground. His feet near my face, I could see a massive gash in the sole of his foot with pine needles and dirt sticking to the blood that was oozing out. I heard voices coming from the direction I had just come from. I wasn't sure if it was the same men, but I didn't want to risk it. 
I jumped up on my feet, smacked his leg, and said go, as loud as I dared. I started running east, and I heard his limping footsteps pounding on the ground heading slightly north of me. There was a hill ahead with several large boulders that I could somewhat see through the thick trees. I continued running until I reached it. I climbed up the hill and I could smell that weird odor again. I followed the odor and I found the hairy man collapsed on his back on the ground. He was taking short, rapid breaths. I could see that he had two holes in the far right side of his chest where there was blood oozing as well. He looked human, yet he didn't. He looked like he could kill me single-handedly, but I had an overwhelming urge to help him. I knelt down beside him and grabbed his massive hand to try and check for his pulse. I could feel a strong beating under his skin giving me hope. He looked at me with eyes that seemed to ask for help. I pulled the first aid kit out of my pack and looked at what I had trying to figure out the best way to make what I had work. I keep my day kit light, carrying only things that will patch me up enough to get to help. I only had two hemostatic gauze pads. The chest wounds were the most concerning. I put my ear near the wounds listening for sucking sounds, then applied the gauze when I heard none. I applied pressure for several minutes, then ripped two pieces of tape off of the roll to hold them there. His eyes were slightly open and watching me as I gestured for him to open his mouth. He closed his eyes with his mouth still shut. He could have indicated to me by now if he didn't want me touching him, so I went for it. I carefully pulled open his mouth to check his gums and tongue, keeping my fingers clear in case he decided to snap his mouth closed. His gums were dark, but his tongue was pink. I didn't see any signs that his lungs had been punctured, but when I looked at his teeth, they weren't quite like a human's. His canine teeth were larger, but not as oversized as a gorilla's. Once the critical injury was dressed, I went down to work on his foot, washing it gently with some water from my pack. He started moaning, lifting his head up and looking at me, but he didn't jerk his foot away. I did my best trying to clean it out using one of my maxi pads to wipe away the debris and dry the skin. The cut was long nearly an inch deep across most of it, and there was a hole on the top of his foot as well. His foot was very broad and flat and the wound was trying to splay open. I filled the cut with ointment and used the tape to make massive butterfly strips to pull the two sides of the wound together, leaving drainage gaps between the strips. I left the hole on top uncovered to serve as a drain as well. I then took my last maxi pad and strapped it to the bottom of his foot like a sandal using tape across the top. I looked back up at his face and I could see a small trickle of blood running on the ground by his head. I had missed a wound someplace. I went back to his side and pulled on his arm hoping he would get the idea to roll over. He was too heavy for me to pull over without his help. Finally, he rolled onto his side and I found two jagged exit wounds on his back, about the size of my thumb. I didn't have much left in my first aid kit, but I did have several tampons. I opened up the tampon package and put the applicator in about an inch deep and inserted the tampon leaving about a third of it outside of his body. I repeated this in the other hole and then pulled on his arm to get him on his back to keep pressure on the tampons. Once he was flat again, he closed his eyes and his breathing slowed down. He seemed to be sleeping. I stayed there watching him for a few minutes and cleaning up my trash when I heard shots in the distance. I needed to get down to where I could find help, but I couldn't leave him exposed. My cell phone didn't have service at this point, so I needed to get down to the road. I didn't think it was likely whoever was shooting the gun would come up the hill but I gathered up the few branches I could find and covered him with them, hoping he would stay sleeping until I came back. I started down the hill on the eastern side heading towards the forest road. Once I hit the flat dirt, I ran south until I saw a truck heading down the road towards me. I could see the light bar on top and I felt so relieved at that point. I knew I was safe. The ranger pulled up to me and I broke down relieved. I knew I couldn't come right out and talk about the Sasquatch. Instead, I told the ranger about the illegal grow, and I said that I saw a severely wounded bear with young cubs they had shot. It was a lie, but I needed him to go back with me and check on him, and he probably wouldn't believe me if I said what he really was. 
We drove back to the hill and we ascended where I hid him. The ranger was following close behind me with his gun drawn. The ranger wanted me to follow behind. I wanted to make sure I was the first face the Sasquatch saw. He likely wouldn't survive another gunshot wound, and if he slammed into the ranger as he did to me, the ranger would likely shoot. When I was able to see the top of the hill, I could see the branches, but he was gone. The blood from his back was still there, but the branches I'd covered him with were arranged into an X on the ground. It's been six years since that day, but I feel like it was yesterday. Since I didn't see him get his injuries, I'll never know for certain what happened. I've read stories about them being protectors of the forest, and I think that's what he was doing. These illegal growers divert water from streams to grow pot, and their camping garbage brings a lot of wildlife to their gardens. They use highly potent and sometimes illegal rodenticides and insecticides and large die-offs are common around growth sites, everything from birds to bears. It would make sense that he would want to push them out of his forest. I'm certain he was shot, and I think when he was running away he stepped on a spike strip and it ripped through his foot. I did my best to take care of him, and I wish I knew he was okay out there. My dad used to take me hunting on public hunting land in the late 80s, early 90s, and we would always, and I mean always, see the same affable elderly gentleman out there. The nicest man. A bird watcher. He would wear head to toe bright orange so no one would mistake him as prey, and he stayed on the main roads and rode a bicycle. Just a fantastic human who spent hours talking to my dad about wildlife and life in general. All of game wardens in the area knew him and so did most, of not all of the regular hunters. Again, this man never went into the woods, wore bright orange which included a bright orange hat, and rode a bicycle. He practically glowed. One day, this wonderful man was found on the road, shot meticulously through the head. No one was ever arrested for his death. My father knew that no one could honestly state they thought he was a deer because of his precautions. We knew the poor man had been murdered. We never went hunting anywhere near there ever again. Three teenage witnesses were playing basketball from 6 to 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning. The weather was clear and sunny, and they were across the street from a fire station in Fairview, New Jersey. While walking back to a friend's home, the reporting witness noticed that the area was empty of cars and people when normally there would be 50 to 100 people in the park. The witness stated that he observed rainbow colors out of the corner of his right eye. When he looked, he saw a shining silver metallic saucer with round tinted windows. He alerted his two friends who also saw the craft. He heard and felt whirring air and a roaring sound. His shirt was flapping as if in a five mile an hour wind, but there was no wind. They were paralyzed and could not run. They later arrived back at his friend's home with no memory of walking there. The witness discussed the incident with two friends, both now deceased and they had no memory of being on the craft as he did. He recalls seeing them on operating tables, but he was standing approximately 30 feet away. The craft appeared larger inside than outside, possibly 400 feet across. About 25 creatures, approximately 4 feet tall, were present with about 10 to 15 around him and the rest around his friends. The creatures were gray in color with large round heads and large black eyes, the creatures were touching him all over. They were speaking telepathically and were surprised when they realized that he could hear them. His mother had previously told him that psychic abilities were common in their family, but he had never really believed it. He asked why they were there. His impression was that they were friendly and curious and meant no harm. He believed that they were trying to help his two friends who both had heart problems and he believes that their lives may have been extended by the aid rendered on the craft. He remembers looking out the window and down onto the basketball court where they had been playing. He could see other beings moving about in long corridors. He remembers seeing the craft ascend after they had been returned. It moved up and to the right, then left, then up and away, leaving a rainbow-colored trail behind. 
When he returned to his home, his mother said he seemed changed, and he replied, It's no big deal, Mom. Before this report, he had only confided this story to his two daughters because he did not feel that anyone would believe him. I wasn't alone. I was working on a shrimp boat that was out to sea. Unbeknownst to me, most of the coastal shrimpers just go out for the day. For reasons unknown to me, our captain took us way the F out there. I think he said something about trying out new shrimping grounds. Anyway, we were heading into a storm turned out to be a Cat 2 hurricane and the boat was rocking. We got our rescue here I and waited for the inevitable. It never came, but none have slept that night. It was eerie passing through the eye. Totally calm, while everything else raged around us. We had all made our peace. The next morning we had either gone through it, or we came back the way we came. Either way we were on the edge of the storm. The captain was tired so we took the day off. The first mate and I sat on the deck for a fair bit of the day watching the last of the hurricane and the start of a new storm. We thought we had this smaller storm beat. We lowered the boom mast again and braced for heavy seas. The first mate brought along a bunch of weed and taught me how to roll a joint in your hand and how to smoke it. By this time Iz was getting late in the day and the storm was getting more energetic. Lots of thunder and lightning. We could see the reflective light and hear the thunder so we knew it was at least 10 miles out. The first mate who was pretty stingy otherwise rolled me a big old fat joint and told me to enjoy it. Of course I was in hog heaven. It never occurred to why the skinflint was sharing all this with me. He absolutely didn't have to, hadn't before, and wouldn't afterwards. At some point it dawns on me. So I ask why now, and not last night when I was wholly terrified in a life vest and hive as ocean survival suit thing. He points off in the distance, and I see a little itty bitty funnel cloud. Looks like a tornado. In the open water they're called water spouts, and they're just as dangerous. So I get kinda worried. The first mate laughed and said look around. There were at least 13 water spouts within a few miles of us. The first mate wasn't watching the storms. He was watching these water spouts pop up every so often, getting a little closer each time. By now the captain is awake, and we're booking it anywhere but where we were. By the time all was said and done we had gotten passed by three different spouts, got a rain of sand dollars, jellyfish, and a load of other ocean goodies. We had one go directly over us and touch down ten yards from the deck. I was scared of the hurricane, but these salty dogs were totally and completely terrified of the water spouts. It was and is by far the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. Noises in the woods being followed by a black bear are all upsetting, but for some reason being in that boat at that time got under my skin. I am in the army and while training in Hohnfels, Germany. Our platoon was sitting on a screen line conducting an area reconnaissance mission. During the night, the guy on guard heard someone bang three times on the left side of the Bradley, which doesn't make sense because you would need another large metal object to make such a noise. Less than five seconds later, he heard the same three knocks on top of the turret. A few seconds pass and a high-pitched tone comes through the headset with three knocks on the back door of the Bradley along with someone screaming, Hey, let me in. This wakes me and one other up and we open the door thinking it's someone in our platoon who was trying to get in touch with us. There was only complete darkness. We waited about 30 seconds, geared up and checked a 50M semicircle around our Bradley finding nothing. We get back inside and every fault light in the turret is on with some blinking, they don't blink ever. The radios were also completely dead. We restarted the turret and everything worked fine. Called over the net to see if anyone was near our area and no one was. Next day we asked the OCS essentially referees and no one else was out the night prior. Shortly after, we discovered an old tank half buried and rusted out near our position. We came to the conclusion that it must have been ghost Nazis. I was camping at a popular campground in the mountains with my boyfriend. But it was November, 
and it was their last open weekend, so no one was there. We were chatting and having a good time around the campfire and drinking. My boyfriend had to go pee, so he walked to the other side of the road and peed in the bushes. While over there, he very slowly and quietly got my attention and pointed out the large glowing eyes staring back at him from the bushes. He still has his D out while in a stare off with a mountain lion. We very carefully backed up and stayed really close to the fire until we went to bed in the car instead of the tent. We could hear it walking around after we went to bed that night. The worst part was I went to find the pit toilet 15 minutes before this all happened. By myself. I even got slightly lost while trying to find it and was probably being stalked by the cougar. I've been pretty nervous camping ever since. I saw an elf or leprechaun, so I went off trail and started aimlessly wandering in the general direction of a peak in the Uintas. From up a steep slope and from behind some very thick tree line, I started getting pelted with green pine cones. Those shits hurt. They were flying at me from quite a distance, and I tried to angrily chase down the source, but the terrain was was too difficult to negotiate quickly. I didn't see one shape or even the hint of movement through the trees at all. It's like the pine cones were coming from absolutely nowhere and arcing perfectly through thick trees and nailing me almost unerringly. Not a one hit a single tree or branch, and that would have been impossible for me to do. Worst part? I could hear faint, high-pitched, creepy laughter. When I was about 10 years old, my mom had her second kid. We didn't have a ton of money, so it wasn't uncommon for our cars to break down or need to be repaired. Well, one day my mom, my baby sister, and I were heading to my aunt's house. She lived kind of up in the mountains, so to get there we had to take a pretty steep inclined highway. Then it veered off into the more rural area where my aunt lived. About halfway up the incline, my mom's car started to sputter. We could feel the car giving out, and I remember my mom just trying to get the car as close to the exit as possible. Well, the car didn't make it, and we broke down on the side of the highway. This was before cell phones were popular, so the only way to get help was to walk to the nearest payphone. We were probably about half a mile or so away from the exit, and right off that exit was a gas station. My mom told me to get as close to the guardrail as possible, and we began walking. Within a few moments, a man pulled up beside us and asked if we needed a ride. My mom cradled my sister, shoved me to the side, and quickly said, No to the man. She did that hip bump thing that people do, and at first I was like WTF, because if I would have fallen over the rail, I would have tumbled down a pretty steep hill. But then I looked over and very clearly saw a gun on the man's front seat. It was half covered with a handkerchief, but it was clearly a small handgun. He pulled it closer to him and tried to fully conceal it, but both I and my mom had already seen it. He drove slowly beside us trying to convince my mom to get in the car, but my mom just kept saying no. But she wasn't rude or mean about it. Calm as a clam, just friendly as could be. He finally pulled off as we got closer to the exit, I'm guessing he wanted to stay on the highway. Once he pulled off, my mom looked at me and said, he was going to kill us. She was still eerily calm as F. My name is Ataraxia and I'm in high school. Last year, I went through a bad episode of depression. I'm doing much better currently and I was scrolling on TikTok and found a video of a girl who claimed she shifted into another reality in her sleep. At that point in my life, going to another reality even just for a few hours a day sounded great to me. Out of curiosity, I looked up tutorials and other info on YouTube and it soon became an obsession. For about eight whole months, I dedicated my free time to learning how to shift. The shifting I am talking about is not the kind where people say they went to an anime or Hogwarts or whatever. My desired reality as they call it was just a normal world where some of my problems did not exist. Since there are infinite realities that are similar to ours, I hope to reach one with those qualifications. 
On February 8, 2023, I decided to try shifting. I wrote down the date of when I went to sleep and the details of my desired reality. I tried my best to hold my vision of me waking up in that desired reality for as long as I could, but I fell asleep and had a dream of my previous day at school. I don't think the dream had to do with anything just adding it. I woke up disappointed and grabbed my phone to turn off my alarm, and I saw that my wallpaper was different. I thought it was weird, but I thought maybe I changed it accidentally somehow because the new wallpaper was an old one I had not too long again. Then things started to get strange as I got ready for school. Things were very slightly different. The pink pot on my desk no longer had the Kirby face I painted on it. My shoes were in a different cubby than I placed them in. I go to a private school so I place my school shoes in a top cubby so that they are easier to reach. I no longer had a paper cut on my thumb. My blazer was wrinkled and in the laundry even though I washed it and ironed it on Monday which would be February 6. My jewelry dish was gone and instead my earrings were just on my nightstand. Those are just a few of the differences I can remember right now. I instantly thought about the shifting thing I tried last night and assumed the worst which is I am in another reality. I continued on with my day and I found out that no, my problems were not gone, so this was not my desired reality. School was different too. The road lines were much more worn out than usual on the way. Someone who I didn't know personally waved at me at school. I hit my hip really hard on a bench that I have never seen while turning my usual corner pretty fast to get to bio class. Our school banner in the courtyard was different. My assigned seat for religion class was different. My apps on my laptop were arranged differently. A character I had recently gotten in a gacha game was no longer on my account and the currency count was different game was Honkai Impact 3rd and the character missing was Hersher of Truth and a bunch of other small changes that I don't distinctly remember. All I could think about all day was the fact that I was somewhere different and I was not home. I have never been one to be overly stressed and have panic attacks, but the stress was overwhelming and crushing. My head and eyes were hurting by the time I got home. When I got home, I went to bed and tried to shift back. I wrote on a piece of paper, home, over and over again, and put it under my pillow shifting method and set it in my head and imagined myself waking up at home again. I fell asleep and woke up. I started crying from relief when I saw my Kirby pot with a face again. The experience felt surreal to me, almost like a really vivid dream and I was very willing to peg it off as one. That's when I checked the date on my phone. It was Friday, February 10th. This meant I spent a day somewhere else. My friend that I didn't recall being with much yesterday, as I spent my two breaks in the bathroom panicking at school, even asked me if I was all right and that she was worried about me. Last night, since I had been acting different and was very stressed out yesterday, she knows that I am struggling with depression. I said it was nothing and that I was perfectly fine. Does this mean that I switched consciousnesses with another me? And if that was the case, did we both try to shift that same night, or was it just me? Did I shift? Was this a dream? Was it something else? Either way, I took this as a sign to never try shifting ever again. Home for summers during college friends, and I would often grab a couple of 12 packs and drive off into the woods somewhere and have a little fire. Nothing crazy, just a few beers and shooting the shit. Our normal spot had gotten blown up. Someone had blocked off the road, so we decided to go off in the woods on my friend's farm. There was no road, so we are just walking through the woods in the dark, looking for a good spot when we hear coy dogs howling in the distance. Then we hear coy dogs howling from behind us. Eventually, they are howling all around us and clearly getting closer. We noped the F out and ran back to the car. I was walking on the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in the Stout Memorial Grove. It is approximately one mile in circumference. I was going to go to the left and circle around, but there were two young guys that started to walk off trail to a big tree, so I went to the right. I thought it was the two guys messing around, but I didn't hear any laughter after it. 
The hair on my arms stood up after I heard screams. I turned around immediately to leave because it was getting late, around 6.40 p.m., and the sun was starting to set. About 20 feet back down the trail, I noticed a black figure standing about 120 feet from where the two young guys were standing earlier. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up because it was about 7 feet tall and backlit by the sun. The face was partially obscured by a branch, and it was too far away to detect an odor. I took two quick photos of it and left. I didn't realize what I had photographed until later when I reviewed the photos. Unfortunately, they're bad, so I won't post them here. Also, the creature was strikingly all black, seven foot tall animal standing on hind legs. Its weight looked to be between 250 to 400 pounds and looked like a bodybuilder. It had a long muzzle, long pointed ears with tufts on them, really long arms with a big chest, and a smaller waist. A branch covered a portion of its face. It was about 30 yards away. This was not a bear, it looked like a werewolf. It was on a hot summer night that I was out in the dark woods with my neighbor, whom I'm pretty close with. He was like extended family, honestly. The fact that I didn't even know we were going until that night when I was sitting at home in front of my laptop playing video games. My neighbor came over to see me, and he asked me if I wanted to go camping with him and his family. It had been a while since we last did anything together, so of course I said yes. It would have just given us an excuse not to go to school for a couple of days. This was in September, so school had just started back up and the coldness of fall had not yet come, so it was perfect. The next day, his family and I gathered our camping gear. We're driving down a dark road with tall trees on the other side of it. It was getting dark quickly, so we had to turn the lights on, unfortunately, which means we would have had to set up in the dark. So we're driving for about an hour, but it felt like it took forever. My friend's dad turned left at an unmarked intersection where there wasn't even a sign saying that this was the right turn off the road. The road got bumpy and rocky as he drove over this very raw, unpaved road. That's when we came across a large clearing because all I could see around was trees and darkness. Where we stopped at this makeshift campground, I say that because there was no clear indicated spot to set up a tent, a spigot, a bathroom, or anything. This was truly camping just down the middle of nowhere, perfect. Now I need to say that it was pitch blackout, and it had gotten really cold now that the sun had set. But we were all so higher up in elevation, so we got everything set up quickly and decided we would huddle up in the tent together that my friend's father had set up for us. But I just had this feeling lingering within me that we weren't alone. Now my brain was playing tricks on me, so I decided to step out and get some fresh air. It was eerily quiet until I heard this screaming noise. My heart began pounding fast as if it knew what was coming. Then we heard a wrestling noise in the bushes, more screaming from the woods. I was so scared that my friend told me to come back into the tent. Now, not only could we all hear the noises, but then as I got back in the tent and we shined our light, we could see something moving outside the tent. This shape, my friend's dad got a flashlight shining at it. That's when this thing begins screaming and thrashing. Now we're all yelling, freaking out because we can see the shape of this thing more. It looked like an animal, but all we could see was this large shape, and it was terrifying. Looking from the silhouette, it looked like an upright deformed reindeer or something, and it had long claws. It was where we being pranked. I wasn't even sure. It screamed again in our direction, and we just prayed for it to leave. It walked around our tent, and we all kept our flashlights shining at it through the tent material, only revealing its silhouette. But one thing I noticed is it never came closer to the tent. It's like it was pissed that we set up camp here in its area. I get it. This probably sounds like some sort of amateur creepypasta, but tell it to my family, my friend's family, and me who have to deal with the memory of this thing. We stopped hearing it almost literally after we all pretty much urinated all over our sleeping bags out of terror. Surprisingly, none of us had any weapons on us. Somehow we all forgot. We got lucky that night, 
but who knows what would have happened if it were to come back and possibly check out our tent. Now, of course, my friend's dad regrets that he didn't bring any weapons. He forgot. He normally always carries a pistol. I went home the next day, and we didn't get any sleep that night. What was designed to be a civil day trip turned into a quick overnight terror. I've not been able to go camping since. I don't think I ever will, you know. And I'm also not sure what this thing was or where it came out of. I haven't really sat down to try and research either. I don't really care. I just want to get rid of this memory. The encounter only lasted a few seconds, but it was one of those what the F am I sharing airspace with moments. He was in the US Navy flying P-3 subhunters back in the 80s and was on one of his many flights jumping from one island to another way out in the Pacific. At one point he was on another one of his long hauls somewhere over the ocean hundreds of miles away from anything. At around one or so his co-pilot spotted some kind of aircraft coming from the right side well ahead of them at a much lower altitude. It didn't have any position lights on or anti-collision lights, just a few night formation light strips. They could only see a bit of moonlight reflecting off it but could tell it was something somewhat small-ish, as in not a bomber, sleek, and definitely not a B-2. Going by how it looks after the fact. This debuted in 97 or F-117 or any other plane he recognized. But it looked like it would have been a stealth fighter or attack plane for sure. My dad flashed his landing lights to basically say, Hi, we're flying here. Daff what you doing? At this point, the other plane turned off its green nighttime navigation lights and visibly picked up its pace. They got one last look at its moonlit features before it went under their nose. There was no trace of it after that. They flew the rest of the trip assuming they were being monitored very closely. Nothing ended up happening, and they didn't tell anyone or so he tells me. If anything else did happen, he probably isn't allowed to say. He was 100% positive it was military, but he has no idea what. Whatever it was, he clearly wasn't meant to see it, and he was flying right above it. Hundreds of miles away from civilization and thousands away from the mainland. Edit, and I should also clarify. The B-2 obviously wasn't out at the time this happened, but it was when he told me this. Knowing how it looked after the fact, he was sure it wasn't a B-2. I have an older guy friend who grew up in 1950s Alaska, where his dad was a bush pilot. So one day, they're out flying around just for a nice day, and suddenly the entire sky goes red. Complete red in clouds and no radio. At the time, he's old enough to understand what was going on, but still young that they just don't talk about it. His dad continues flying for hours and not a word but still thinking that the Cold War had just ended in thermonuclear holocaust. It wasn't out of the question. Alaska was a target close to Russia, and this was the height of the Cold War. The sky is still forever red. Finally, they start to run out of fuel. They have to land, but they don't know what's going on and zero ability to find out. His dad eases the plane down, finds the landing strip, and goes in for an emergency landing. They make it down perfectly, no hiccups, bumps, or anything. The airport is besides itself red sky and an unannounced emergency landing, and a crew guy comes up to help them out. What's going on? His dad asked. You have no idea just how lucky you are. A volcano just went off, and you've been flying through the debris. Thank God no thermonuclear warfare, and they were stupidly lucky that the plane didn't stall out in the middle of nowhere Alaska with a volcano spewing nearby. When I was around 12, 15, I was hunting with my dad and his hunting buddy. I was with my dad and our friend was off a different trail. At the end of the day, we always met up where our trails met to walk back to the truck together. My dad was trying to teach our friend over the radios we used to use and couldn't get anything from him for about 20 minutes. As my dad and I are almost to the crossing, he comes on the radio and says he's on his way. 
We get there and soon after our friend shows up entirely out of breath and sweating like a pig. Mind you, we're in the north woods of Wisconsin during gun deer season, so he has very heavy clothing on, and his spot was about one miles down the trail. He goes on to tell us why he didn't answer and what happened. He was sitting in his ground blind and saw some movement in front of him. About 50 yards ahead, he saw a black bear cub, and only the cub. It sat down and started clawing at a tree trunk. He didn't move or make any noise because he knew Mama Bear was close and didn't want her to find him. He sat there watching the cub for over an hour, constantly trying to find Mama Bear, but could not get eyes on her. Finally, the cub lumbered off, and he decided it was safe to move out. By the time he answered us, it was already getting past dusk and starting to get dark. As he was walking, he heard a breath and felt hot, warm air on the back of his neck. The man is six feet four, so there's only two things that could have been tall enough to do that. A person or a standing bear. He panicked and sprinted for over a mile down the trail until he saw us. Luckily, he wasn't chased and made it back safely, just sweaty and beat. I used to hunt as a kid with my uncle and grandpa. The first time I killed a deer, I was alone, covering my side of the mountain while they ran the deer towards me. I shot a buck right in the side, but he was just a button buck, only nubs for horns. I thought it was a doe, so that's why I shot it. I was so excited, right up until I walked up to the deer and it was gasping for air. I shot it in the lung, it was horrible. I felt awful, I cried. I didn't know what I had just done. When my uncle found me like 45 minutes later, me sitting next to the deer I just killed, he was so excited. But he could tell I wasn't. We dragged it out of the woods, butchered it up that night and made burgers. I couldn't finish mine, just didn't feel right. Never went hunting again. I was 15 or 16 at the time, so I was old enough to understand what was going on. Anytime anyone talks about hunting, I think back to that morning. I have no problem with people hunting, by all means, but I could never go again. A 26 female recently moved from the U.S. to the Balkans for a summer legal internship. After a few days of getting settled in my home for the summer, I decided to sign up for a gym nearby my apartment to serve as a self-care ritual and blow off steam after tough work days. Coming home from my first workout at the new gym, endorphins on 100, I noticed at a crosswalk that a man across from this busy street where I was stopped was staring at me. Now this is not super uncommon as I have found in my new home, and I have gotten used to dealing with occasional male stares, but they are usually very brief. This guy, however, was not looking away. I stared back for a full beat, so I know he knows I saw him, hoping that would be the end of it and then turned my head away to continue down the street trying to avoid a creepy feeling that this wasn't the end of the interaction. From what I could tell, he didn't cross the lengthy street to meet me, and probably just continued down from his side. Next thing I know, about two minutes later, I'm at a crosswalk about to cross, when I see him in my peripheral next to me at the stop. How he crossed the street and sped up to meet me so quickly is either a reflection of his cunning and athletic prowess or my general lack of observational skills. Standing next to me now, he is still staring at me, but I try not to tip him off to my noticing this. I take off as fast as I can when it's safe to cross the crosswalk, and naturally, he matches my pace, a step or so behind me, still staring. Here I find myself in a familiar situation that I imagine many who have been followed also find themselves in. It is a critical juncture, if you will, where you ask, is this someone following me or a silly misunderstanding? I begin to ask myself, am I overreacting? I have been followed many a time before, sadly, and so I have found that the best way to handle it is try to cut the baby in half, so to speak. I give them the benefit of the doubt to prove to me they aren't doing what I fear they are doing, while also trying to avoid any situation that would escalate the danger or cue him off to where I am going. Trust but verify. So I decide to zip quickly toward another street, 
Not my own, we were like one block from my apartment by the time I noticed him at the crosswalk with me, in the hopes that he would prove me wrong and not continue to follow me. This was a busy intersection, and there were about six different streets to follow from the crosswalk. He follows me down this random street of choice, where there is truly only residential buildings, no stores or restaurants he could be headed toward to explain him choosing this street unless he lived nearby. I do something I have done before when followed to test the other person. I slow down and speed up my pace randomly to see if they match mine or like a normal person heading somewhere. Try to walk by me as there was plenty of room to do so on this street. Within a block or so I realized he was definitely following, definitely still staring. But not only that, with every few steps, I felt his presence, keeping pace, was also subtly getting closer and closer to me. The sun is setting at this point, and we are walking towards a part of town I don't know as well. The spirit moves, and I decide to make a break for it. I slow down as slow as I have gone throughout this whole pursuit, checking my peripheral, and jettison myself across the street until I get to the other side. I look back once I am there to see that he is now looking across the street and moving toward it to follow me more. But this time, I give him the meanest glare I can muster and reach for my bag as if to suggest that I reaching for pepper spray or something hadn't bought some yet in reality because I had just moved to town a few days before. He notices the gestures, makes eye contact, stops, and then literally turns his head away to feign looking at the numbers on the street like he was lost or looking for a specific spot, as if he hasn't been slowing up and speeding down with me for the past 10 minutes, not looking anywhere but at my backside. Acting 010 for capturing the innocence of someone definitely not creepily following a woman half his age back from the gym for 20 plus minutes. He continues to pretend to look around, glance back at me, look around some more, glance back at me, and when he looks away for the third time, I decide now is the time to truly make a break for it. I begin booking it down the opposite street, while occasionally peering back to see if he kept following. I take a bunch of well-lit, busy streets, employing random unnecessary turns, as I have when I have been followed before. Eventually, once I check out the whole street and feel confident I have lost him, I finally calculate my way back home. The next day, I asked a friend from work who is local to take me to get some pepper spray. I bought a mini version, the smallest size, that can easily fit a purse. The pepper spray's brand's name for a bottle of this size is literally called Madam which is emblazoned across the side of the bottle in bright pink lettering. Third shift in a children's residential facility, which is a 100-year-old orphanage. Now it's for abused kids with behavioral emotional problems. A lot of them have nightmares regularly and so in the dead of night. I'll be startled out of my rounds because someone will scream or something. Some of the kids talk in their sleep and sleepwalk, and it's creepy as F. There's the kid who will wake up and open his door and just stare at you for about a minute before quietly closing his door and going back to sleep. One time he opened his door and zombied his way over to my coworker and I, dead-eyed and slack-jawed, and we were like, dude, what? And he finally goes, I want biscuits, shit. And we were like, get the F out and go to bed. Not that great of a story. Walking around the grounds at night with my head full of other staff stories about parents showing up to try and steal their kids back. Never happened to me, but did happen to another staff before, and I'm a paranoid person. We have a ton of ghost stories about this place, though because the facility was built in the 1-800s to handle the influx of orphans produced by a cholera epidemic in the area. The building is old as hell and full of hidden tunnels and passageways that staff can use to get around fast, but like hell I go in any of them. Staff who have been here longer have ghost stories about seeing shadows, hearing things, etc. I have none, but one time I was taking a kid to the basement to do laundry, and he stops and goes. Mrs. X, there was a man standing in that room, but he's gone now, and I was like, well, it was probably a ghost, little dude. Let's get this laundry done. Honestly, though, the creepiest shit around here usually happens during the day with the little dudes are awake. 
Love them though. Did some sailing in the past with my family in the Caribbean, and one night we anchored by Norman Island, the island that is allegedly Treasure Island from the Robert Louis Stevenson tale. The typical anchoring area in deeper water was pretty full by that point, so we ended up going to a less sheltered area closer to the beach. But it wasn't a big deal as it was fairly calm. Anyway, as night fell, the water became luminescent. There were these jellyfish that would light themselves from inside in what looked like a glowing green clover thousands of them. I'd never seen or heard of anything like it, and it was only happening near the shore where we were it made us happy the deeper anchorage was full as we never would have seen it. They died down after about a half hour when it was getting truly dark out, but before bed I dipped my foot in the water and the jellyfish nearest me started all lighting up again. One giant nope and my foot was out of the water before they got any ideas. Come to think of it, that was also the night of the 2003 US invasion of Iraq. So we spent it listening to the BBC report over the shortwave radio in the dark, watching these luminescent jellyfish all around us. What a surreal evening. This took place in 2019. One night, coming home from a friend's party, it was me, my girlfriend, my brother, his girlfriend, and her friend, we had an extra seat, and she was staying with us. We were making our way home and decided to take a road that would cut our travel time down. Everything was cool until my brother wanted to stop at the gas station to get gas and food since he believed in the classic gas out cliche. We arrived at the gas station and he decided to go in and get food while I stayed with the girls. Everything was going normally until a big black 18-wheeler semi-truck pulled into the station. We thought nothing of it. I wasn't paying much attention to him until he got out of the truck and stared at us. When I say staring, he was looking into our souls. Now I was worried, and my brother was still in the store. We couldn't see his face as he had a hoodie on, covering his entire face. I was skeptical, and so were the girls. He was doing a lot of suspicious things, like going behind the trailer, peeking his head around, and even walking on the other side of our car and standing there. We locked the doors, and I immediately called my brother who held the door for him. The two bumped into one another. My brother had food and got into the car. We immediately sped off, heading towards the highway. There was this long stretch of road before getting back on the main highway. We were talking about the truck and how weird he was acting. Some time went by, and that same truck had followed us, but he passed us at fast speeds, nearly taking us off the road. We couldn't make anything out because it was a white trailer with no company labels. We were scared now, and we put it to full speed. We had lost him since our car was faster. Long story short, we got back to our house and parked our car in the garage. Now that we were settling down, all chilling in the living room, we saw bright lights outside our house, and it was the same truck passing through. It was scary because trucks never pass on our road. We were scared that he had followed us. Turning the lights off, we waited the whole night to see if he'd return, but he never did, and we never saw him again. It was one of the truly creepy experiences we had seen before. Ages ago, when my father was still racing small sailboats, he did a number of races that took multiple days so he and the crew would have to spend at least one night on the water. One particular race had started under nasty weather conditions that quieted down to light fog in the evening. My dad and the crew were exhausted and looking forward to taking turns getting some well-needed sleep. My dad's buddy took the first watch on deck while the rest of them went to bed. It seemed like only minutes had passed when the guy on watch shook my dad awake. You have to see this, you have to tell me I'm not crazy, was all his buddy would say. Now pretty spooked, my dad went up on deck to see what had scared his friend so much. The guy pointed into the dark fog, and suddenly my dad saw a pair of glowing eyes. They turned this way and that like a creature lazily looking around. Sometimes it would look away, but it would eventually turn back to gaze in their direction. 
For a moment, Dad thought it must be some bizarre kind of lighted boy, but the movement pattern was completely random, and the eyes were moving up and down completely at odds with the movement of the waves. And it was getting closer. Confused, exhausted, and now pretty damn concerned, my dad woke the rest of the crew and brought everybody up to see this thing. Yep, everybody saw it, but nobody could identify it as anything other than eyes. The movement was so eerie, and it was approaching pretty fast. As it swam closer, it was clear that whatever it was, it was enormous. Now everyone was starting to freak out. Dad had no idea what to do except to try to move out of its way, but the damn monster kept moving around. The crew finally determined its rough path and altered course to avoid it. It was getting very close now. They could hear the rush of water around its bulk and a strange groaning and hissing. It was getting closer and closer. Blat. Everyone's heart stopped when the horn shattered the night. Suddenly they saw dim navigation lights through the fog and realized the monster was riding a big ass barge. They watched in silence as the bulk of the barge materialized. As it passed alongside, they realized it was carrying a load of garbage and there was a little bulldozer driving around pushing the garbage into tidy piles. The monster's eyes were the headlights moving around, climbing up and down the mounds and circling around the deck. They were pretty relieved, but then Dad realized that they had basically almost run into a giant barge. So nobody got much sleep that night as they kept watch for more monsters in the fog. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.